in, of our webinar today. And as John said, um, uh, I'm head of mental health engagement and recovery with the, the HSC. And the function of the Office of Mental Health Engagement and Recovery uh, is to lead out on that partnership uh, approach with service users, family members and carers, and indeed all other stakeholders uh, in working together to ensure that our mental health services are, are more uh, recovery orientated. And we, we work in a co-production uh, approach to achieve this. And we have a, a few areas of, of work um, that, that we focus on. The main areas of our work are uh, on promoting uh, recovery uh, practice and recovery uh, education. Um, and recovery education uh, is one of the key drivers of a, a recovery orientated service. And in uh, our services now, each area has a recovery education service, and many of them have recovery uh, colleges. And um, recovery education is open to everyone, uh, and it offers people opportunities uh, to learn more about mental health, to learn more about mental health services, and to learn more about um, recovery and what their role in it is. And if you'd like to learn any more about recovery education, uh, you can go on to the uh, HSE Mental Health Engagement and Recovery uh, page on the HSE uh, website. The second strand of our work is uh, around engagement, uh, engaging with uh, service users and family members on their experience of using our service. And to help us do that, uh, we have a, in each area, we have um, an area lead for mental health engagement. And they coordinate uh, structures uh, to uh, help us carry out the engagement, uh, primarily in uh, mental health engagement forums, where any uh, service user or family member can, can attend and share their experience of uh, using our services. And that feedback is very important to us uh, be, because it helps us to ensure that our uh, services are more uh, recovery focused. And the third area of uh, the work of the uh, Office of Mental Health Engagement and Recovery is around the Service Reform Fund. Uh, and this is a program which um, helps us to uh, ensure that the organizational and culture change uh, required to make our services more uh, recovery focused is happening. Um, so it tries to embed practices and structures um, that allows that to happen. Um, and its main areas of work would be around the IPS program, um, uh, housing and um, developing recovery innovation. So I've talked a lot about uh, recovery as I showed us, it's the, uh, I suppose the, the key objective of our uh, services is to help people uh, to recover from their mental health challenges and lead uh, full and better lives. Uh, so it might be just helpful to remind us uh, what exactly um, we mean by recovery. And to do that, we're going to have a short video clip in a moment uh, that will take us through that. After that, then I will be handing over to um, my colleague Sinead Reynolds, who is a Senior Operations and Performance Manager with the HSE uh, Mental Health National Operations Team. And she will be just talking about um, the benefits of uh, partnership with service users, family members and carers. So um, I hope you all have a, a very enjoyable uh, time on the webinar. And now let's hear about recovery. Thank you. 
In Ireland, the Health Service Executive Mental Health Services vision is that recovery is a reality for all. So what does that In Ireland, the Health Service Executive Mental Health Services vision is that recovery is a reality for all. So what does that actually mean? Well, anyone can experience mental health challenges. The good thing is people can and do recover. So how does a serious mental health challenge affect a person? Well, it may impact on their ability to carry out normal everyday tasks. It may be difficult to form or maintain relationships, find or hold down a job, make friends and be part of the community. It can be a very lonely place as they may have experiences that others just don't understand. So what is mental health recovery? First of all, it's personal. Recovery is as unique as you are. It's about living a good life with or without symptoms. It's about what you can do, not what you can't. It can be a journey for some and a destination for others. And it's not always easy, but with the right supports, recovery is real. Evidence suggests that recovery is best supported by five things. Just remember the word Chime. C stands for connections, having good relationships with other people. H is for hope and the belief that you can recover. I is for identity, having a positive sense of yourself. M represents finding your own meaning and purpose in life. Finally, E is for empowerment, focusing on your strengths and having control over your life. That's Chime. Good morning, everyone. Can everyone hear me okay now? Grace. Thank you, and um, I hope you enjoyed that video. Sorry for the uh, slight delay. Um, Michael has spoken about the work that we do on the mental health engagement and recovery team, and I'm just going to speak a little bit about how we work in a recovery focused way. So we work in this way to ensure there is a greater involvement of those with lived experience of mental health challenges and those who support and care for them in mental health service provision. In 2018, the National Framework for Recovery and Mental Health was developed, as many of you will know, through co-production. The framework supports services to continue to embed recovery within, within mental health. The framework has four principles, the centrality of the service user, co-production between all stakeholders, organisational commitment for recovery and supporting recovery education and recovery practice. A further set of actions was also developed to support family recovery. On the national team, one of our strategic aims is to lead and support the development of mental health services which are responsive to people's needs. 
So how do we do this? So it's so important to incorporate lived and family experience into service improvement. This is done through our local and area forums, which are established by the mental health engagement leads. And we'll hear more about that during the panel discussion. Individuals and families are empowered to become leaders in their own recovery. Training opportunities are provided such as recovery principles and practice, forum training and QQI training. Partnerships are promoted between all stakeholders for better recovery outcomes and examples include national groups which are which include family advisory groups, trauma-informed care groups and universal access for recovery education groups. We continue to ensure recovery education is accessible for all and a great um, example of this is the employment of recovery education facilitators across the country this year. We identify and promote best practice and innovation in recovery and engagement and we are currently developing measurement tools for recovery education. Locally, there are a huge number of actions taking place which support the four principles of the framework and it would be hard to do them all justice, but I'll just give you some practical example of what, of what is happening locally. So RAP workshops are being co-facilitated and co-received and people are also having the opportunity to become RAP facilitators. Peer support workers are employed on local mental health teams and we'll hear more about this during the panel discussion as Martha is a peer support worker. Recovery education courses and workshops are available across the country. These include co-production workshops and also linking to other community partners and organisations. The HSC is committed to recovery locally and this is seen with recovery principles and practice workshops being attended by all staff and mental health forums having representation on service groups such as steering groups and working groups. Family therapy and support groups are available in certain areas and peer support workers who support families are now being employed. So as you can see, there is a wide range of activities going on which support the work of the framework. And we hope this continues throughout the next year and into the next lifetime of the framework. So I'll now hand you over to Sinead Reynolds. Sinead is the General Manager um, um, for National Operations and Performance in Mental Health and Community Operations. Thank you. Hello, can everybody hear me? Hi, Sinead. Okay, I think you can see me now, can you? Okay, so can see and hear. Great. <laughs> That's great. Brilliant, thank you. Lots of responses. Okay, so my name is Sinead Reynolds and I work with um, the Mental Health um, Operations National Management Team and I'm here today representing Jim Ryan, who is the Assistant National Director and Head of Mental Health Operations. Um, and he would be here himself, except that um, an unforeseen um, meeting came up that he couldn't get out of. So he asked that I would represent him this morning. And I was very happy to do so because this theme is something that's close to my heart. So it's nice to be asked to come and talk at an event that you, you feel is really important and should be happening. So thanks for asking me and it's lovely to be here. Um, I suppose th the important thing to say is that both engagement and recovery and, and the importance of lived experience are, are topics that are very close to my heart and always have been. And I thought just to, to say something a little bit different this morning, I thought I'd speak a little bit about my own journey in mental health services. Um, so I started my career as a speech and language therapist in CAMS many years ago. And I suppose working as a speech and language therapist 
with people who are experiencing mental health difficulties and their families was, uh, I suppose, a, a really good start in terms of my um, passion and um, um, how I feel about engagement, because I was working with people whose voices weren't heard and who had communication difficulties. So people who struggled maybe at times to understand what the mental health team around them were saying, and certainly people who struggled to have their voices heard. So from very early in my career, um, the voice of the service user was a very strong um, part of what I did every day. And I also worked very hard with family members because in, in child and adolescent services, um, it's really important that we involve family members. And I suppose many years ago, we would have seen perhaps younger children that are seen now. So family members were very much part of what I did. Um, and after that, I moved on to work in detention settings. And as everybody knows, when you're working in detention and when you're working with deprivation of liberty, things like the rights of service users and the voice of service users and family members are really important. Um, and in those detention settings, we would have had quite a lot of oversight from the courts and from people like guardian ad litems and lots of structures in place to ensure that the, the rights of service users were upheld and that their voices were were heard but yet what what I found working in those settings is that sadly often there were times when the voice of service users weren't heard despite all of those supports that were put in place and and wondering about that I suppose the conclusion I came to was that often that's about the dynamics of power and when people are at their lowest ebb and when deprivation of liberty is part of what we're dealing with then there always will be dynamics of power and that's why it's really important that we work hard on things like um, engagement and recovery and ensuring that the voice of service users and their family members are heard because there are dynamics of power in health services and there and we we need to be very aware of those and um, I came back to mental health in 2017 and at that time engagement had really taken off so I had been gone from mental health for a few years and I suppose I was really pleased and excited to see what had happened in terms of engagement and recovery when I was gone on. So recovery would have been talked about before I left, but when I came back, there were all sorts of exciting things happening. So we had a head of engagement on the national senior management team. That was Liam Hennessy at the time, and that he has been replaced by Michael Ryan very ably since then. So we have a head of engagement at the senior table involved in all of this, the decisions that are being made around resources, etc. And that was really, really um, exciting. And, and I think progressive in terms of of the international um, um, situation because we are ahead of the game in, in that respect. And um, there were also engagement leads in each of the CHOs and people who were committed to looking at engagement and recovery on a daily basis as part of our mental health teams and our management teams. We also had peer support workers and I suppose working with people in, particularly for me in the SRUs, hearing from people in the, in the, the specialist rehabilitation units, I've been hearing about how important that peer support working is and how it's really important for service users to have people working with them who have lived experience because it's, it's different from working with professionals. So that was really exciting. Also, the recovery colleges were up and running. Um, and I know we've more work to do, but, but they, they were up and running and, and working very successfully in certain areas. Um, we also had engagement fora, which we certainly hadn't had when I had left mental health. Um, and again, there is more work to do do there in terms of making sure we hear all the voices but the fact that the engagement for our up and running is really exciting and we had service user involvement in service improvement projects and I am a sponsor on a number of service improvement projects and so had the pleasure of having a service user representative at the um, steering committee and working groups of, of many um, service improvement projects within mental health and it was really I suppose important to have a service user as part of that so all of those progressions that had happened when I was gone were all really exciting and um, I suppose it's important that they're happening but it's also important that we don't think we're finished because while we've done lots of really good stuff there's certainly more to do 
in terms of engagement and recovery. Um, so I suppose my opinion is that the involvement of service users and also family members helps to keep us focused on the right things in mental health. And I certainly have been at tables where the fact that we had a service user in the room kept people focused on the right things and made sure that we stayed on the right track. Um, I think it's important as well that, that we involve service users in, in our analysis of services and that we make sure that we have structures that allow us to ask service users what the services are like for them, because it, that's the really important question. That's why services exist in the first place. So we need to be asking service users what's it like for you in order to keep us on track and that's kind of a, a quality check so uh, we need to be clinically excellent in our services but we also need to ensure that our services are meeting the needs of the people who they serve so it's a really good reality check for us and also I suppose the involvement of service users in everything we do is therapeutic in itself it's empowering for service users and it's part of how we do recovery so with all of that in mind, I think it's very fitting that today we are celebrating this as part of World Mental Health Week. And as I said, it's really, um, it's a, a great privilege to be part of this. So thank you for asking me. Thanks. I'll hand you back to Ashling. I'm not sure who we're going back to now. So I'll just come off the video and I'll let you take it from there. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Sinead, uh, for that very empowering speech um, and hearing about how lived experience really helps us or really helps the service move towards a more recovery oriented service. Um, good morning, everyone. And uh, I suppose uh, just to introduce myself, my name is Michael Norton. I am one of the National Engagement and Recovery Leads with the Office of Mental Health Engagement and Recovery. And I'm here today to facilitate a panel discussion in regards to lived experience and how lived experience shapes the role um, of various roles that are going on across the country. We have a panel of six people, uh, six very inspirational people, um, uh, and we're going to introduce them now. Uh, so firstly, on our panel is Marta Clark. And uh, I know Marta very well, and Marta is a peer support worker within the Irish Mental Health Services. And through her work, uh, she, has, has, she has had the opportunity to become part of, of working groups uh, that work towards service improvement in the areas of care planning, uh, the use of restrictive practices, and the development of guidance around smoking and mental health. Marta has been involved in recovery education and the development of peer-led initiatives within the southeast of Ireland since 2015. Next on our panel is Maureen Lynch. And Maureen has served on the board of Galway Simon Community for 10 years and was appointed chair in 2016. Maureen recently retired from Wood PLC, an energy, an energy engineering service company where she was the global human resource ma programs manager. She has extensive experience in HR, having held senior HR management roles in HP, Compaq and Digital in Galway and the United States. She is a member of Galway uh, Local Mental Health Forum uh, uh, for the last three years, representing families and carers. She has a master's in counselling, a BA in psychology, and a HDIP in personal and executive coaching. Next on our panel is Virginia Moyles. And Virginia is a peer educator with the Galway Recovery College. She brings many years of experience in education, training, and personal development as well as her own experiences of mental health challenges and recovery to the provision of transformative learning in recovery in mental health. She spent several years facilitating groups uh, with AWARE, a founding member of CUSON, uh, Galway's community peer-led peer support group. Next on our, on our panel today is Kieran Moran. And Kieran is a 56 year old gentleman with lived experience of mental health challenges. He uh, also supports people um, with their own mental health challenges and is a member of the Mental Health Forum in Mayo. 
Next on our panel is Oliver Myrna. And Oliver is an area director of nursing um, in, for the Dublin South Central Mental Health Services with responsibility for older adult and CAMS inpatient and community services. He is a registered psychiatric and general nurse and holds a Master's of Arts in Management and Healthcare. His professional background is in acute and community mental health nursing with extensive experience in challenging uh, and busy environments. He has worked in a wide variety of national and international settings and that experience has shaped his approach to fostering high standards of care uh, with the person at the centre of everything the service does. Fi uh, finally on our panel, and not least, is Charles Searson. And Charles is a father of four grown-up children, uh, a self-confessed bon vivier, and uh, is a boisterous advocate for broader inclusion. He recently achieved a master's degree in business and has been involved in a number of business ventures ranging from direct managing uh, marketing to wine distribution. Following a sudden and intense transition to supporterhood about seven years ago, Charles became involved with RAP, which stands for Wellness Recovery Action Planning, and later became one of the first peer supporters with the Detect Services in BlackRock. Charles is currently the area lead for engagement responsible for Community Healthcare East. He regularly guest lectures in UCD and Trinity College in Dublin. So they are our, uh, they are our six uh, main panel speakers for today. Um, and at, in a moment, I will give them the opportunity to introduce themselves, uh, but also uh, discuss what are their roles um, and how does lived experience shape their roles? So if I could start off with Marta Clark, if you could uh, let, uh, inform us on what is your role and how does your lived experience inform that role? Yeah, so that's that's a big question really. Um, yeah, so my role is uh, a peer support worker. So primarily I would be employed to deal one-on-one -on -one with people in a supportive way um, to help facilitate recovery for them um, and to share, I suppose, some of my own um, knowledge because I've been lucky enough to have, you know, an experience of recovery myself. Um, so that would be kind of the, the core of what, what I would be employed to do. The other parts that I would find myself getting involved in would be safe service improvement initiatives, even on a local or a regional level. Um, I feel lucky to be uh, to be invited to more groups than I can even actually do because I have to remind myself what my priority is and that would be, um, you know, the, the supportive role. But it is great that there is a, such a welcome for lived experience starting to starting to build in the services and I would see myself as as having a lot to contribute to those because I can see now the way the service works from the inside, whereas before I would have had a kind of an outside uh, view of it, even when I was using services myself. So I can see kind of both sides of the coin in many ways now. Um, and that that's a, a very important reflective position to be in. Um, so yeah, my lived experience would inform my role in so many ways in terms of um, in terms of, say, what I want to, to say to somebody, I would always be quite reflective in my practice. How would I feel if I was, if this was suggested to me um, or this was said to me? And even using lived experience is a, is a skill in itself. So I would have seen my ability to use my lived experience develop across the time I've been employed since 2017, um, that it's not you know, it's not always relevant in terms of what you share. It's more about the values that you hold and how you recognize and acknowledge what somebody else is going through. Um, so yeah, I would say that my lived experience is intrinsic to what I do, but it does take more than lived experience to do what I do. And I might come back to that later, but yeah. 
Thank you so much, Marta, for that insight into the world of peer support working and how it is really, really important and really, really uh, a valuable role uh, for people. And as you said, it's not just about sharing that lived experience, it's about having those core values in you as well. So that's really, really important. Thank you, uh, Marta. Uh, just before I move on to the next um, panel member, uh, this will be an interactive session, uh, so please send in any questions you may have on the chat box uh, to us. Uh, we will try uh, and endeavour to actually uh, get through to all of the questions uh, that you've asked there today. If we haven't done so, we will we will work on answering those questions in the next few days. Um, but please keep sending in your questions to the panel members and we will ask them in due course. Um, the next uh, panel member I would like to uh, uh, get their opinion of is Maureen Lynch. Um, so Maureen, if you can give us a little bit about what your role is and how lived experience uh, informs your role. You're on mute there, Maureen. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Sorry. No. Um, um, <clears throat> Yeah, I'm a family member, a carer of, of my son, who has uh, been experiencing mental health challenges for the last 10 years. And I think I sort of stumbled into this um, movement, uh, if you will, by trying to figure out what is out there for people uh, to support them in their recovery. And you know, it's not easy to navigate those services that are out there when you're not part of them and don't work for the HSC or really understand how things work. So I would have done, I suppose, a lot of research myself into trying to figure out what services we could offer to my son and to me and my husband and my other children um, in terms of support for us as family members. Uh, throughout the ups and downs that we've been through. So I, I don't know how exactly, but I stumbled upon the uh, Galway Local Forum and went along to a meeting and um, discovered, I suppose, the engagement aspect of um, this whole thing. And, um, you know, it was interesting. I just went out of curiosity, I suppose. Um, and then uh, I learned that my opinion really did matter. And that was great uh, because I, I was the only one there representing family members and still am to the best of my knowledge on that forum. So that's a voice that often doesn't know how to engage. Um, that I would have been an example of that for the last 10 years. I didn't, well, I guess maybe this focus hasn't been there for 10 years, but as you're saying, 2018, um, but anyway, I'm delighted that there is a focus now on recovery because that's really what it's all about. I mean, that's what I want for my son and my family is to be happy, to have a normal life, to, um, you know, uh, have a better life. So I'm happy that I stumbled into this whole thing. And, um, you know, it's led to my becoming involved now in a working group on the recovery modules, which has been very interesting. We're, we've just started out on our journey to make recommendations in that regard. Um, and it will be co-produced with uh, lived service, lived experience people and carers like myself. So I think it's a terrific um, opportunity to get involved for anyone out there who might not know how to, I would encourage perhaps more outreach or something to get this message out. I mean, this panel today is a very good step in that direction and um, I'm happy to be involved. Thank you so much, Maureen. Uh, thank you so much, Maureen, for that great insight into what it's like uh, for a family member uh, in the men's health services and how the local forums um, in your opinion, has helped you to have that voice uh, within services. Um, so next on our panel to introduce, themse to introduce themselves and to discuss about their role and how lived experience shapes that role is Virginia Moyles. Mm -hmm. 
Hi, Michael. Thank you. Um, well, I'm Virginia Moyles. I'm the peer educator with Galway Recovery College, and my role is coordinating the work of the college in terms of co-production and co-facilitation of all of the recovery education programmes that we offer our students. Can you hear me, Michael? Yes, we can, Virginia. Keep going. Right. Um, so I bring my own lived experience of a diagnosis of clinical depression and recovery to my work um, through our co-production. So trying to ensure that we reflect the lived experience of as many people as possible with mental health difficulties. And that's an integral part of the three perspectives. So we also co-produce with, of course, um, family members and people providing services. So bringing that lived experience, I think, offers hope to our students and offers the opportunity to um, find their own path towards recovery. I think it um, hopefully enables people to empower themselves to seek out their own path because everybody's path is different. And they get the opportunity to hear about different um, experiences, different pathways to recovery and get um, support in plotting their own path, hopefully. Um, working with other people, we do a lot. Um, of course, we're working on the three perspectives all the time. So we're always working with family members and service providers, both in the college and on working groups to um, expand and enhance recovery education and on um, changes to service provision as well. And I think um, the benefits of involving our lived experience is that, well, our students recognise that all three perspectives are integral to everything we do. And we get some um, very positive feedback from them on their learning, both whether they are um, people with lived experience of their own mental health difficulties, their family members or service providers. Everybody um, does seem to be learning a lot from what we're doing. I think that's all I want to say, but thank you. Thank you so much, Virginia. Um, and it's really interesting to hear how lived experience really shapes how the Recovery College, uh, uh, you know, the ethos of the Recovery College and that of co-production as well, and how, you know, the lived experience is as valuable as the learned knowledge as well, which is really, really important. Um, thank you so much, Virginia. Uh, next, uh, to introduce themselves and to discuss a little bit about their role and that and how their lived experience shapes their role is Kieran Moore. Good morning, all. My my name is Kieran Moore. I'm a 56 year old. I am I'm I'm a service user between the UK and Ireland and Ireland. Um, I am I'm I'm involved with the Wear since 2013. I have raised funds of over 100,000 with a couple of other people in the last five years. Through through that, I heard I heard about the Recovery College. And I joined that in 2015. The Recovery College has, has done an awful lot for me. Um, I was asked to join the engagement form or the open form in 2018 when it started in Casabar. Uh, our, our aim working is working with the HSE to improve services and, and um, with, with others people to share our opinions and improve services and ed educate each other really on, on from staff down to service users like myself that we can tell them what, what we witness in the unit and that they can 
they can either act on it or advise us what to do. Um, because it, it re- really, it's all it's all about um, trying to build trust in each other and to help people relax when when they're when they're in there to trust others to recover and uh, above all, really, is is the um, services after the leave the unit and. You know that they're followed up by staff to um, to um, be help to survive and not to feel lost when they when they go out on their own after because oftentimes that's where the problems are, and that's really that's really the op- what what we aim to do on the open forum is just talk with each other and try and sort things out and. Um, as I say, one one thing we looked into was towards the pajamas thing and the unit where they had to wear them, and visitors were going in and they were seeing that you were a patient that you weren't just visiting someone else because we're, we're everyone was mixed together, and um, they they've relaxed back on that now, and it's an option whether you wear it or not. Um, we 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 we're also trying to look after the, one of the biggest things really is to look after the after service after people leave it and that they know exactly what what they're doing and they know the support there for them that's that's me really if um you have any questions there's no problem i'll try and answer them thank you Thank you so much, Kieran. Uh, and it's really interesting to hear how your the, the forums and being involved in forums really fosters your lived experience, um, and and how uh, it, you know your lived experience is actually making a difference. Uh, and that's those simple things like trying to get uh, the 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 pajamas, uh, the the, the way, what you have to wear in the hospitals, trying to make it more so not pajamas wear, but 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 the person, what the person wants to wear. And that's really, really interesting as well. Thank you so much, Kieran. Um, next on our panel discussion, just to introduce themselves, is Oliver Myrna, uh, Myrna sorry. Hi, can you hear me, Michael? We can hear you, Oliver, thank you. Nice. Uh, thanks, Michael, and uh, thanks to the other Michael as well for inviting me to be on this forum. Uh, I've really enjoyed the contribution so far, and I'm learning a lot, actually, from every video. Um, I suppose over the years I've practiced in a number of different areas, and I suppose over that time working as a nurse, I've experienced firsthand the growing change in our approach to delivering care. Uh, I think the growth of recovery practices uh, with that growth, I think we've realised that recovery is much more than treating illness, but also us as kind of service providers, we need to look through a different lens uh, to ensure people are empowered and they're making informed choices and, you know, to determine their own destiny and their goals in life. I think that's challenging for mental health services because I think we're very much built on our own systems and structures. But the only way to progress it, I suppose, is to understand what recovery-focused service, you know, should or might look like. Um, I've been asked as well to talk about lived experience and how it's utilised, if you like, in our service. I think there's been a number of drivers behind that, obviously, in the, of the national strategies, such as sharing a vision, and the Mental Health Commission has obviously been long advocating um, for recovery-oriented services. Uh, the National Recovery Framework obviously highlights lived experience as one of its central tenets of recovery. I think that ability to self-determine one's own goals and take responsibility and to know what's important as a person and I think for us as a service to understand that the expert experience of a service user and what they're able to bring to the table in terms of co-production and partnership, I think is really important. I suppose in our service uh, over the last few years, uh, our approach to developing recovery focused services um, based on lived experience has gained momentum. As we know, all services have you know, area leads in mental health engagement and they've set up local forums which are starting to influence and shape our service strategy. Um, I think Michael would have mentioned earlier about the, the service reform fund and I suppose our attempt to get our own house in order around that because we didn't get it right at the start and we're, we're trying to get that right now. So we've set up a service improvement group uh, which is based on a partnership approach which you know, we've active members from service users, carers, service providers, our 
area engagement lead, uh, and also, I suppose, our community partners, such as Threshold and Gateway, and other services that work closely alongside us, like Eve Holdings. And I suppose this is a high-level oversight group that works to ensure recovery-focused services and communities with clear pathways to community living, employment, and recovery. And we try and oversee and monitor a number of working groups around that, you know, and you know, some of the achievements might be you know, the, the, uh, the individual placement and support workers, you know, working with people to gain active employment, and um, looking at community living groups, which are for us is looking at our models of you know individual housing options and moving away from our traditional landlord approach in the HSE and you know trying to yeah, moving away from the highly highly support support residences as well. And trying to establish relationships, if you like, for service users and carers in the community. I think our recovery program is providing education to staff and service users through recovery facilitators. And we're in the process of employing peer support workers. And it's great to hear from Marta earlier there. And, you know, it's, it, it gives me a great understanding of, of what we're missing out on, I suppose. Uh, I think from a service user's point of view, the approach towards care planning, we have struggled with it. And I think it's, it, it is starting to make slow gains now uh, to ensure that we hear the lived experience of people and that we're able to share it in their care plan with the person's own words, the setting of personal goals with you know, a co-production approach. Finally, I just mentioned some of the benefits. I think you know, certainly from bringing in the service improvement group, there has been better communication for our service. Um, and I'm talking from a staff point of view, I suppose from top down and bottom up, I think we've started a real and a meaningful conversation about the way the service is delivered. And we're starting to challenge, I suppose, the traditional systems and structures. And, you know, and some clear examples, you know, we've, there are two people have been placed in full-time employment. We have a number of housing support workers now, and they're directly employed by folks working alongside people looking for individual support. So I think there's a number of really good examples there. And I, I think it's, uh, it's really, for us, it's trying to balance, I suppose, the, um, the good aspects of the biomedical model, uh, along with understanding the centrality of the lived experience. And I'll just finish off and just leave you with a quote I heard recently, and I think it's very relevant to us all, and particularly us as a service. I think we have to stop being afraid of what can go wrong and start being excited about what can go right. Thanks, Michael. Thank you so much, Oliver. And it's interesting to hear from the service provider's perspective how the lived experience uh, and the lived experience the lived experience of people but also the roles that encompass lived experience are really starting to infiltrate into the traditional sessions and how they're making a positive and lasting difference to the people that are using the services um it's interesting the way that you brought up about the the, uh, the care plan and how that is um how that is a true representation of the lived experience of the person as well so thank you for that oliver um lastly but not leastly i'd like to pass over to Carol Searson. How are you doing? Um, can, you, can you hear me, Michael? I can hear you, Charles, yeah. Okay. Okay, excellent. Uh, well, th thank you so much for, for having me. You know, some and say again. You're freezing on us there, uh, Charles. Sorry, now the, the words of wisdom they left from the previous panel panelists. Um, can, uh, can I be heard? Sorry, Charles, you're still freezing on us. <laughs> I'll stop my video and oh dear. Try speaking there now, Charles. It looks like we have lost Charles. Um so uh, until Charles come back, what we might do is just move on to some of the questions that you've raised in your Am I uh, back? Are you back, Charles? I hope so. Can you hear me? I can hear you better now, yeah. Not really. 
we can yeah go ahead yeah i can yeah look i'm, I'm, re I'm really sorry that I'm, <laughs> I'm in a house with a whole bunch of people who are all trying to use the internet at the same time so <laughs> you can imagine what it's like um I'm, I'm kind of overwhelmed by the uh the wisdom and the insight that we've heard so far my role is as an area lead for engagement um, so um, I'm, I'm responsible for Community Healthcare East and that idea of co-facilitating the setup and the, and the running of the forums um, and trying to ensure that the forums are seen by the local management teams as an asset and trying to ensure that the voice of people's experiences, which is expressed in those forums, is, is brought to the management team in a way that they can, they can work with it. So trying to turn a person's story into an experience and a reflection that might be used for, for service improvement. Um, and I suppose to ensure that the management team are in a place of being able to hear people's experiences of what's working um, and to hear people's experiences of what um, might be improved in a way that they don't find it challenging to the great work that they're doing. And I suppose traditionally um, there has been a mistrust of people in the community of the mental health services and the people who provide them and indeed a mistrust um, in, in the management teams um, of the idea that people would come to the table and, and, and sort of, you know, start creating havoc. And I think that trust is starting to build and it's, it's lovely to see. And I think there's a whole bunch of really positive things that have happened alongside that, which is about people having found their voice, wanting to work a little further, and get involved in, in, in other activities, in the co-production of education, to get involved in the development of policies, to work on national panels to, you know, to make sure that recovery and recovery initiatives uh, nationally and at an area level are, are being implemented. And so most of the Seahawk Jolo areas, if not all, have recovery uh, improvement and implementation groups, which came from the old ARI groups. And now, as, as, as Oliver was talking about, service improvement groups have sort of evolved from that, integrating with uh, the funding from the Service Reform Fund and other initiatives that are happening. But I suppose what we're starting to see um, in in the in the forums and in, and and in the development of policy, because we, our area is really interested in in in, in advancing policy. Um, is that because of Sláinte Care um, and because there's a broader view of the integration of, of public mental health services with community and voluntary groups and um, as Oliver was talking about asking the HSE not to be involved in things that they shouldn't be involved in you know for instance like they shouldn't be landlords I mean that's that's kind of clear um, is to is to help first of all the service to reconfigure itself over time into something that's much more community based and much more community integrated but the second thing um, and this is what brought me and I suppose you were talking about a little, you know, what is my personal experience it's about having a broader view of what mental health or mental ill health is and from my personal perspective as, as a family member, I can say that a mental health crisis in one person in the family is a mental health crisis for everybody in that family. And when I use the word family, I, I, I mean family of choice, that group of people who share a fridge, as somebody so beautifully put it to me. Um, I think it's really essential that we start to look not just at the whole person for the whole of life, which is the slogic care approach, you know, mental and physical health working together and the whole of life from, you know, from prenatal right through to, to end of life, but also to look at whole family or whole unit, because I think that's where this whole idea of supportership and needing support um, in terms of the recovery focus really becomes important. It's what, what resources and education do supporters and family members have in order to be able to uh, properly uh, help a person uh, recover and what recovery needs do those family members and supporters need for themselves. So I'm looking forward to that part of the discussion with the panel. Thanks a million. Thank you so much Charles for that insight. Um, into the area leads uh, life, um, day in the life, so to speak, uh, and how uh, you're, you're involved in so many different groups at management level and bringing the, the lived experience uh, point of view to, to that management level uh, area. So that's really, really interesting. So thank you, Charles.
Um, so what I'm going to do now is going, I'm going to ask uh, some of the panel's members some of the questions that you have raised um, within the chat box. Please feel free to add in more questions as we go along. We might not be able to make all these questions, uh, might not be able to answer all these questions today, but uh, there will be a meeting with the panel members after this uh, where we will sit down and endeavor to answer all those questions that you've been a you've been asking so please keep firing them in away um i might uh just switch things around a bit instead of going in in order um so i would like to ask uh maureen um what have you seen uh as the key issues for mental health recovery due to covid and public restrictions and how do you see them being overcome going forward um, well, obviously the, um, Zoom, you know, approach <laughs> to everything lately, um, has some advantages, strangely, um, because, you know, you think of, um, I don't know, people talking face to face, obviously is always preferable, but when that's not possible, we do have alternatives and sometimes it, it, it can actually help a shy person um, you know, uh, get involved in conversations and uh, the flexibility is there too. And from my work with the Simon community, um, it's very interesting because we made sure that in all our sheltered housing um, that we put, we gave uh, all, the, all the homes uh, PCs and so on and showed people how to use Zoom and what have you. And we actually saw an increase in accessing um, recovery education modules um, as a result. Um, so the encouragement <clears throat> to you know, participate in other ways um, has been working. So that's a good thing. <clears throat> Obviously the isolation of people is not a good thing because <clears throat> people with mental health challenges often are, feel isolated anyway. <clears throat> and that's certainly something that I can notice from my son, who's really quite lonely right now. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's, I think, for a lot of people, made it very difficult to cope with. But there are some positive tools that I think we need to encourage people to use. Thank you so much. And it's really interesting to get your insight in this because I suppose it is a key question for a lot of people. What kind of restrictions, due to the restrictions of COVID, um, how are we, how is that affecting people? But also, um, how is that affecting the mental health recovery movement as such? And it, what's really interesting to hear from yourself is that there's both, there is both pros and cons to it. And the pros is that you're reaching new people that you haven't reached before, but you're also, it's, it's the flexibility. Um, you know, it's not everybody has to be in one place at one time. It's that flexibility that's there as well. Yeah. But also the, the challenges, of course, being that of isolation um, and that that can obviously have negative effects on one's mental health as well. So that's yeah. really interesting. Thank you, Maureen. Um, I'd like to ask Kieran, if that's OK, a question. And this is one of the questions that kind of keeps coming up. Well, kept coming up while you were speaking, Kieran. Um, and it's basically uh, someone asking um i suppose how do you let people know about what recovery options are available are you there kieran Kieran, I'll come back to you if that's okay. Um, uh, but I would now like to ask Martha a question. And Martha, there was an awful lot of discussion whilst you were speaking there today as well. Um, oh, oh, sorry, Martha. Uh, Kieran is coming in through audio there. So, Kieran, we still can't hear you there, but. Still can't hear you, Kieran. Sorry, now. Now, go ahead. Just can, 
uh, hope, hope forever, can hope forever to go back. Yeah, I started game with like, um, I we really need to have something left with doctors that uh, a, a list with doctors to uh, off the services that's available. There are no different spots in the towns and all different offices and people do not know where to go. And I, I know it's only through going through different um, meetings and things like that, that you find out about something else. But you shouldn't be left in that situation because, because people need to know from day one. People think the only thing, the only cure there is is medication. Mm-hmm. But in fact, probably 10% of it is medication. The rest should be through different talk therapies and meeting the right person at the right time and being fit to get CBT when, when, it's, when it's due to you and different things like that. That's been my opinion on it. Thank you, Kieran. Uh, and it's really interesting to, uh, to hear from your point of view about, uh, you know, what, what we as a service can do to actually um, make sure that people that have lived experience of mental health challenges, their family members, their carers, have information to all recovery resources. Um, and that fact as well that the acknowledgement from even from a service user's point of view, and I can relate to this acknowledgement as well, that, you know, medication, although it is part of, of the of the treatment process, and it has a va- very valid role in recovery, uh, that it only has a certain amount of a role in recovery, and that the rest of it is up to yourself and, and learning new techniques for yourself. So thanks, Kieran, for that. Um, so I might just pass over to Marta Clark, if that's okay. And Marta, as I was saying earlier, there was a lot of questions coming in when you were speaking. Um, and uh, I suppose one of the, 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 the ones, uh, one of the questions that are hitting, that's being asked is hitting around that aspect about, you know, that lived experience and that sharing aspect of things. Um, uh, and the question that I'd like to ask you is, what is your key learning discerning the, uh, that your lived experience is not just about sharing? Yeah, I was really taken with that question myself. I thought it was really nuanced um, and there are a few different sides to it. So say in a, in a possibly tautological sense, when you use your lived experience and reflect on your own experience, you might think to yourself, how would I feel if somebody jumped in now and used their lived experience? So say for example, there would have been times in my journey when my friends might have rushed in with, oh, I I felt that before, I felt like that before. And instead of me feeling connected to them, I might have actually felt a little disconnected because I was thinking, no, my experience is not just like yours. You know, I don't want to be diminished by that. Um, And that is a really key skill to know when to share and when not to share. Because if the sharing say is going to make somebody feel upset or it's not going to empower them or inspire them in any way, I don't believe there is a need to share. Um, I think I would have felt pressure to share more about my lived experience uh, when I started out, but now I feel a lot more comfortable in it. I have set my own kind of boundaries around it that of course I will stand in my own truth and I will say what I think when the time is right, but I will never diminish somebody else's lived experience or act like mine is more important than theirs because really I see my role as bringing out their lived experience so they can stand in their own truth and say, this is what I have learned about myself. This is what I have learned works for me. Um, And that will be individual to them. Uh, So yeah, I think, uh, does that cover that question? (laughs) I I think it does, uh, Marta. And, and, And the key takeaways that I'm taking from that, if that's okay, is, is it's, it's, you know, your lived experience is important when when you're working with people uh, who has lived experience. But it is, it, it's that thing of being mindful of what do I need to share in order to create this, ter- in order to create this relationship. Um, and it kind of links back to my own studies in a way, because it's kind of like, okay, so 
do I share my whole narrative when I'm when I'm connecting with someone, or do I just share the bits that are that are relevant to this particular case, if that makes sense? But also, you're trying to think as well. If I share a bit of my narrative, is this going to have a negative impact on that person? Because is this going to show, oh, I had a worse experience than you, and I got through it, kind of thing? And kind of having that really bad. Uh, I suppose it would be a really bad kind of notion that think that, oh, you're boosting yourself up by saying, oh, I was worse off and I'm better now and all this kind of stuff. Yeah. So it's kind of really that balancing act between really sharing uh, what is necessary to share to that, that would allow for that relationship to occur and not sharing too much to cause yeah. a negative aspect to that relationship. So that's yeah. really, really interesting. You could relate it back to, I think Sinead Reynolds spoke brilliantly about kind of power dynamics and, if I'm sharing my own story, it's one, because I feel safe with the person that I feel that we're on the same level, that we're in an environment where I can, we can both feel safe and share in a safe way. Um, and two, that it's creating that mutuality, that, you know, that recognition that we've both had something similar go on in our lives and that that might help form the foundation of the relationship. But it won't, it won't necessarily define the relationship because we could have a lot of differences as well. But um, yeah, just that trying to even the playing field a little bit and to be conscious of the power dynamics um, that can happen when you're, when someone is referred to you, um, you know, and, and they might not know exactly what they're going to get out of this and they want to keep an open mind, but there might be a bit of ambivalence there. And that's perfectly natural as well. Um, so yeah, that's, yeah, it's a brilliant question. Thanks for asking it. No problem. Uh, and, and thank you to the person that asked it as well, because it really is in a very, very important part of peer support, uh, trying to make that balancing act and trying to make sure that you're, you're doing, you're sharing just enough to allow that relationship to form that is really, really positive and mutual in nature. So thank you, Martha. Uh, I'd like to pass over to Charles now, Charles Searson. Uh, and there's a question that's after coming in um, that I think is really interesting as well. Uh, and I'm just wondering, um, do you think it's timely that a national directory of mental health engagement local forums with a profile of their work and experiences be produced? I couldn't agree more. Um, and, and that's something we, we, we should be doing. I think, you know, we, we've been walking as, as a group of leads working in engagement. We've been walking on new ground and building the path by throwing bricks in front of us. Um, now's the time, I think, to start to become a little bit more nationally organized in terms of communications, in terms of directories, whatever. And, you know, we all know that directories go out of date as soon as you publish them. So we are probably looking at online resources, really. Um, but I think it's one of the essential functions of any local forum is to be a point of welcome and information to people in the community, whether they're supporters, family members, or even, even staff wanting to reach out into the community and voluntary sector to find other resources outside of what's available in public mental health services. So from, from everybody's point of view, I suppose that lived, shared lived experience, a co-produced directory would be really, really useful. But it's not just, in my view, um, about directories. I think forums um, have an essential part to play in the story that goes behind the directory. Because we've all seen, you know, lists, but what do they mean? And if somebody has got something out, for instance, out of their local grow group, that is absolutely fantastic. Uh, they could also have got something out of a different group like Recovery Inc. or, um, you know, uh, th there's so many, so they're going out of my head. But it would be lovely and I think it's essential that somebody can say, well, I tried that and it was like this and this worked for me. And, and it's not that it might work for anybody else. It's, 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 it's you know, because it's all about a person's individual choice and what works for them. But I do think personal recommendations and, and, and personal feedback add to the richness and effectiveness of any directory. Um, so I think it's, it's a mixture of online resources and also the fact that the forum is there and people should be able to link in and find out more and feel happy, not just to be an active member of the forum in terms of working with the local management team, which was what it was set up for, but also to drop in on forums and say, look, I have a couple of questions. Would you guys mind answering? And, you know, I, I, I just I'd love to know, because um, I think there's that sense of community, a community of interest, which is can be really well served in the forum environment. 
Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much, Charles. Um, and it is really interesting to hear about this whole idea of, uh, you know, local forums having a directory, but also, uh, you know, that that we need to go beyond that now um, and we need to make something that is more you know up to date and uh, a really really powerful for for people to come in and 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 really something that will invite more people to come in to the forums as well so thank you charles um i am so i would just like to ask a question to uh, to oliver if that's okay um, so Oliver, uh, I'm just wondering if you can uh, if you can tell me, uh, do you think that lived experience is valued in your area? Michael, yeah, can you hear me? Okay, we can hear you. Uh, hi, hi, Michael. Yeah, okay. Um, that that's a very good question, actually. Uh, uh, I say a hesitant yes, and, and, and probably no as well. So I'm kind of I'm sitting on the fence here. Um, I think some of the experiences I and interactions I suppose I've been involved in recent years uh, would certainly have a powerful impact on my life. Uh, and I'm thinking of I suppose you know having the area lead for mental health engagement, the impact of local forums. Uh, I think Michael mentioned earlier about uh, you know the likes of Liam Hennessy, people like that, people I really learn from. Um, people I worked with on the you know co-produced oldest programs. Um, I remember hearing a, a peer worker down in Kilkenny one time, or sorry, in Dublin one time. He was from Kilkenny, and it was so inspirational. A bit like Martha there, like you, know, you really get such an insight, and it really it changes how you think, and it opens up your mind to okay, there is a different way of doing things here. Uh, and looking at all the good stuff we're doing with you know the service improvement group uh, through the service reform fund. But I think it also comes with a caveat, I suppose, uh, that like, you know, uh, as service providers, they're still, we're, we're caught up in structures and uh, tightened boundaries, if you like, and we're, we're finding it hard to fully embrace the lived experience. I'm not sure why, that, I, I, I know some ways why it is, it's obviously culture, and uh, you can have all the strategies in the world, that, but we know culture, culture eats strategy for breakfast in the morning, so it's that's, we know that, uh, but I think we probably need a little bit more education and training ourselves to avoid this token involvement, you know, and I think as well, and I'm only talking for our area, and I know our probably our mental health engagement uh, lead would say the same, that some in some of our areas we find it difficult to attract people uh, with lived experience into the force, and that's something I think is really important and we need to really work on, you know. Thank you, Oliver, and it's really interesting to hear as well that, um, you know, and the honesty in, in, in regards to, you know, we are, it's yes and no whether whether the lived experience is fully valued, valued in your area. And, and really it's, it's, it's kind of trying to figure out that balancing act between, is the lived experience being there because it's tokenistic, just to say that we're, we have it, or are we actually using it to the best of our ability? And, and, and you've given us some really good examples of how we can use that to the best of our ability through peer support, through local forums, uh, through area leads, all these kind of things. Um, but it's interesting from, from your point of view, you can see that, yeah, we've made a great start, but we have a lot more work to do. And that's really, really interesting as well. And that's probably one of the roles of our office here in the National Office of Mental Health Engagement and Recovery. Um, I'm just conscious of time. We have about five minutes left in our panel discussion. Please keep sending in the questions. We probably won't get to all of your questions there today, um, but we will endeavour to answer them in due course. Um, my, my final question for today uh, goes to Virginia. Uh, so Virginia, um, I'm just wondering, uh, what difference does it make to, uh, to students in your recovery college when a facilitator has lived experience of their own mental health challenges? Hi, Michael. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Thanks. Um, I think it makes it easier for people to expect to be really heard and understood. Um, I think it also offers hope in terms of when people hear 
other stories of recovery? It inspires them to think about um, what they can do for their own recovery. Um, I think it also um, encourages family members and um, people providing services to review their expectations, and understanding of um, what someone with mental health difficulties can um, do and how they can recover. So I think it can have an effect for everybody. It um, can just offer that hope and that, that role model in a sense, I suppose. Thank you, Virginia. And it's really what I'm gathering from you is that the lived experience is so, so valuable to someone when they're actually sitting in a recovery educational uh, program or workshop and hearing that this person has actually gone through the same thing. And it really helps not just the service user or the family member in the room, but it helps everybody in the room to get that deeper understanding and really it, 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 it has that sense of hope as well that okay this guy has had lived experience or this girl has had lived experience of the same things that I have and they and they're able to sit up in a group and actually say and, and talk about this particular topic that gives me great hope that maybe one day I'll be able to do the same so that's really interesting to hear as well Virginia uh, my final question um, it is for all panel members, um, and it's one that's really a, an interesting question. Um, so it, it basically, uh, people are asking, what, in your opinion, has been the most significant factors that service users should or need to, or service users, family members should or need to consider when becoming involved? I think Martha put it very well. Um, about learning how to express your lived experience in a way that's, that's inspirational to others, but th doesn't deplete yourself. And I, I, you know, from my own experience and, and, and co-facilitating forums, I think that's, you know, that's some, that's a balance that isn't automatically achieved. And I think, um, you know, that from, from that point of view, I think it's, it's, uh, how supportive a forum is, how supportive our society is, at allowing people perhaps go a little bit too far and just letting them at it, letting them express that energy, tell that story, disclose perhaps, over-disclose, and then to kind of model a kind of a, a more balanced, nuanced approach that, that's, that's really healthy. But also to recognise that sometimes people just need to let off because they haven't spoken about so many things that are deeply personal to them. And, and, and okay, it may, sometimes the, the, the space may be inappropriate, but, um, you know, that's healthy, too, that, that people have a space to speak. And, 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 and you know, it's, it's a privilege to, to hear people speak. Thank you, Charles. And it's really kind of lays down the, the thing as well that it's to give it, is it, people need to think about what they're sharing um, and whether they are comfortable in sharing what they're sharing. And that's really important as well, because if you overshare, you know, you can feel really bad inside. Um, but also if you undershare, you're, you're, you feel the same way as well. Um, so it's great to have that. And even using the forums as, a, a, as an opportunity to share uh, your lived experience as well. A, a, a relating to a given topic is really, really valuable to know that that resource is there for people. Um, I'm just conscious uh, of time, uh, so unfortunately we have come to the end of our panel discussion. Um, we have loads upon loads of questions that you've all sent in over the day. Um, uh, apologies that we could not meet all these questions, uh, but we will, do, we will uh, endeavour to, to do so in due course. We will hopefully plan a meeting with the panel members uh, so that we can get those questions answered and sent out to you as quickly as possible. I'd like to thank you all for all those questions that you've asked today. They're all extremely valid uh, and apologies that we could not get to them all. I'd also like to thank our panel members, Virginia Miles, Martha Clark, Charles Searson, Kieran Mar Moran, Maureen Lynch and Oliver Myrna for taking the time out today to actually uh, support us in, in this panel discussion. Uh, and I'd also now like to pass you over to Catherine O'Grady and Debbie Murphy, who will, who will uh, close the day for us. Thank you.
Hi, can everyone hear me there? Um, okay. Yes. Um, I'd just like to say um, thank you to the panel members following on from that, just that it was inspiring, I suppose, um, to hear all of that, because sometimes when you're doing this work over years, you forget, you know, how important and sometimes how slow this work can be and it can be frustrating. And it's when people get together to talk about it, it certainly energizes you and, and I'm sure other people feel the same about that. Um, I'm a uh, Catherine and I'm one of the team members as well. And I'm really pointing you to the, uh, our evaluation piece around this and why it's important as well for us is to hear what you'd like in coming um, webinars. We're hoping to do one in December. So it's great to get the feedback on what you'd like to see more of, less of, or how you found this experience today. Um, so thank you to everyone. And I'm going to hand you over to my colleague, um, Debbie Murphy. And I should also just tell you that the resources, there's a number of resources online, and that's through the Mental Health Engagement website but we will also be um, sending out a, a list of resources that you can find online as well. So um, over to my colleague, Debbie. Hi, can everyone hear me? Yes. Hello. Yeah. Um, my name's Debbie, I'm the Administrative Assistant with the team. I just want to thank you all for attending this morning. I hope you really enjoyed it as much as I did. Um, I want to thank Sinead Reynolds and our own team here ourselves as well. And a huge thank you to the panel members. I think Debbie just lost her connection there um, for a moment. Can you all hear? Just to say um, thank you again on behalf of the team. Um, Debbie was just about to say that and um, we hope you all enjoyed this morning's session. And as we said in the chat function, we will be answering all of the questions were, that were posed this morning that we didn't get to. Um, we'll do that via video and we'll share the video with you. You'll also get your email in the next short while with your resources and the evaluation. So thank you again and we hope to see you all soon.